Greetings. Today I want to share with you a video of Bill Cosby showing you another side of Bill Cosby that most much people do not know about. Now we all know about the incarceration of Bill Cosby and now we know that he's been set free from prison. But most importantly, I want to say to you that true freedom comes from inner liberation. And when you know your true history and you know your true spirituality, you're free. Even if you are incarcerated, you're free. And when you know that you can use your inner power to achieve your every desire, you know that you do not have to be bound even in prison. You can use even your mind to get yourself out of there. So the most important thing and the most powerful thing is to know who you are. It doesn't have to do with how much money you have because all of that could be taken away. And they have this system set up a certain kind of way to take everything away from you. But one thing they cannot take away from you is your true freedom, your true liberty. And that is why I always teach you to emancipate yourself from mental slavery. And in order to do that, I'm saying to you, give back the slave master, his God that he gives to you, which is his idol, Jesus and learn to believe in yourself. So with that being said, I wanna just now ask of you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this short clip of Bill Cosby. And I would have provided a link for you to watch this video in its entirety. So you can go on this person's channel and you can look at the video in its entirety. And I believe that there might be other information, um, important information that would be on that channel also for you to look at. So with that being said, my brother, my sisters, now is your time to see another side of Bill Cosby. Now, what's the whitest thing you know? Whiter than the driven snow, whiter than the whites of your eyes? Sugar. Non-integrated, non-black, sweet sugar. But you see, there is a black man in your sugar. His name is Norbert Rillier. Norbert Rillier in uh, 18, in 1846, invented a vacuum pan that revolutionized the sugar refining industry. Now, you have to dig to find that fact. I mean, it's not much history, but it's still history. Now, uh, what do you stand in? In your shoes. Now, there's just you and your shoes, isn't it? Nope. See, there's uh, a black man standing in your Oxfords with you. Sharing your soul and your heel is a man, his name is Jan Ernst Metzeliger. And in 1863, this is a drawing by the kids, Metzeliger invented the machine that made mass-produced shoes possible. Now, you have to dig around for that fact, too. And again, it's not much history, but it's history. Am I coming in clear to uh, California? I mean, is this TV signal driving through a pass in the Sierra Nevada mountains and slipping into San Francisco? Okay, well, I want to thank you. Jim Beckworth. Jim Beckworth out of St. Louis, hunter, trapper, and honorary chief of the Crow tribe of Indians. We had trouble finding you, Jim. Though you helped open the West, you didn't make the books. Chicago, right here, where the Wrigley Building is. Young fellow by the name of Jean Baptiste de Sable. Jean Baptiste, he founded you, Chicago, when he traded with the Indians. And of course, there it is right there at that particular time. It was called Es Chicago, or Stinking Onion, by the Indians. And de Sable, he didn't even change the name at all. Now you take the Lewis and Clark, expedition here, right in there. You'll find a black man named York helping to open the West. Those men are trying to wash the black out of York. 
That's what you might call historically significant because a lot of people think we ought to wash white, but we ain't gonna, you see. Texas, coming to you, Texas, right down the Chisholm Trail, right here. Right down there with 5,000 black cowboys who never made it to the Hollywood West. Did you know that, huh? In the same group, there was one black outlaw. His name was Deadwood Dick, who claimed his soul brothers were Bat Masterson, Billy the Kid, and Jesse James. Deadwood Dick used to ride into the saloon, order two drinks, one for himself and one for his horse. And here's his horse uh, drinking a shot of red eye with a straw. And how about the 186,000 blacks who fought on the Union side during the Civil War? 38,000 died. How about Teddy Roosevelt's charge up San Juan Hill? It wasn't just the Rough Riders who made it. Four black regiments went right up with Teddy. They didn't get lost going up the hill. They got lost in the history books. How about the North Pole? Snow White? Well, the first man there was black, Matthew Henson. He spoke Eskimo. And uh, he was Admiral Perry's navigator. And although he made it first to the pole, it never quite made it to the history books. And how about your heart? Can we get there? All right. Daniel Hale Williams first performed open heart surgery successfully. Now, this list could go on forever. Blacks who made it, blacks who made history, but who didn't get into the history text at all? And the strange thing is how little there is about us in the textbooks. Napoleon once said history is a fable agreed upon, and the fable agreed upon up to now is that American history is white on white. But sometimes we did get into the history books. All wrong. Now you take this one. The Growth of the American Republic, 1942 edition. Samuel Eliot Morrison, Henry Steele Cummager. Quote, as for. This has to do with uh, slavery. As for Sambo, Sambo, Professor Morrison, Sambo, Professor Cominger, as for Sambo, whose wrongs moved the abolitionists to wrath and tears, there is some reason to believe that he suffered less than any other class in the South from its peculiar institution. Peculiar institution means slavery. Although brought to America by force, the incurably optimistic Negro soon became attached to the country and devoted to his white folks." Unquote. Those lines were written by two Pulitzer Prize winning white Northern professors. Slavery, that's the place everybody likes to start Negro history. You have ignorant black men being brought over from Africa in chains. Terrible thing, slavery. But this way slavery is taught, it sort of takes the sting out of it. Because the way it's usually taught, people think that we Afro-Americans started with nothing but little grass skirts like the kids in the Tarzan movies. And though America gave us slavery, America kindly gave us religion and a lick or two of education. And when we get more jobs and more education, then up from slavery. But, uh, we had something before we left Africa, something more than rhythm. I mean, we had a high culture. The culture was so high that uh, great artists in the world are still borrowing from it. Now, here's a sculpture by an unknown African artist. And here's what Paul Clay took from him. Now here's a work by an unknown black African, and Pablo Picasso liked what he saw. Another African design, and Modigliani swiped it, or he was influenced by it, or whatever polite word you want to use. Another black African artist, and Picasso didn't change it very much. I mean, when you look at this copying, you got to give us a little more than rhythm. You got to give us style. Now, if you tell the history of slavery right, you got a big problem on your hands. The slave trader didn't take some savage out of Africa. He took a human being. He sold him like an animal and separated him from his family. 
America invented the cruelest slavery in the history of the world. It broke up black families. After slavery was over, America kept breaking up the black man's family. And that's some awful history to teach. Now, if you want to look history right straight in the eye, you're going to get a black eye. Because it isn't important whether a few black heroes got lost or stolen or strayed in America's history textbooks. What's important is why they got left out. Now, this country has got a psychological history. There was a master race, and there was a slave race. And though there isn't any political slavery anymore, those same old attitudes have hung around. I mean, the burning part of burn, baby burn, is right here in this classroom. We want to thank Mrs. Lovely Billups and the whole gang here at fourth grade for the brilliant and intelligent artwork that uh, they've done here to make this whole broadcast sing. I want you guys to keep pretending that I'm not here. You're doing a great job and just uh, keep on drawing and reading and writing, doing what you have to do, because I'm going to talk about some other kids. Not you, Mary, John, and Bob. These are kids from other schools. Now, did you know in some states it used to be against the law to teach blacks to read or write? Nowadays, we're getting these integrated school rooms, and most people think that if we get enough teaching and enough jobs, everything is going to take care of itself. But there is a scar of history running right through kids as young as these. It tears you up if you know how to look at drawings kids make, because kids shouldn't know much about history and anything about discrimination. I mean, nobody hates little black kids, but why do some of them cause so much trouble? And if you ask black and white children to draw themselves, or trees, or houses, some strange things happen. We ask some ordinary white kids from ordinary families to make some drawings for us. Like, well, let's call him John. John's white, and we asked him to draw himself. This is John. This is his house, and this is his tree. Then we asked a black kid, let's call him Ralph, to do the same thing. This is Ralph's drawing of himself. This is his tree. Now, why should two kids of the same age draw so differently? Enter the expert. This is Dr. Emanuel Hammer, psychiatrist specializing in children's therapy. Well, let me illustrate it for you. Let's take these drawings. No matter what a child draws, he's really picturing himself. Ask a secure child to draw a tree, and he's likely to draw a bountiful spreading tree. A black child drew this tree, cut off in its growth, stark, bare, ungratified. It works the same way with drawings of people. Normal children, average drawings. The mood is happy, the child feels capable, the drawings are complete, and the arms are developed to emphasize strength. These children were old enough to draw complete figures. The significant fact is what they left out. Arms, hands. A child may sense that a situation in life is so powerless that he himself is equivalent to an armless man. My own study reveals that armless people appear three times more frequently in the drawings by black children than those by white. The faceless being suggests that these youngsters not only feel themselves to be less than they might be, they don't even feel themselves to be. The black child who is forced to live in a hostile world may disappear in self-defense. He drifts through life feeling like a shadow. He stops caring and he stops trying. A child who has this on his mind cannot be a child. A child who has this on his mind could want to burn down cities when he gets older. The whole confusion was summed up by a black nine-year-old in these two paintings. This is a nine-year-old boy draws a white man, Robin Hood maybe. And this is how the same boy draws himself. And this is the consequence of deformed history. Linda, close the curtains. Brian, lower the screen. Bonnie, lights, please. In the past 50 years, 33,000 feature films have been made in the United States, and about 6,000 of them have had parts for black actors. For the most part, the black portraits have been drawn by white writers, white producers, and white directors for a white audience. Most black parts were the way white Americans wanted them to be. The black male was consistently shown as nobody, nothing. 
He had no qualities that could be admired by any man or, more particularly, any woman. When the sun goes down, the tide goes down, we dock a caterpillar and they all begin to shout. Hey, hey, Uncle Doug is featured. White people didn't like to think much about them. Sort of like a relative, uh, you got in a rest home. I mean, happy darkies, dancing and singing was all they wanted to hear about. Being good Christians, the whites out front liked to think the blacks out back were kind of happy. Uncle Tom's Cabin was one of the first movies made that tried to say anything about black people. Uncle Tom was changed a little each time it was put on the stage and all the parts were played by white actors and by the time they made a movie of it in 1903, Uncle Tom was just the white man's idea of a good nigga. You might say he was what H. Rat Brown ate. They made this picture five times. And by the time they finished with it, Mickey Rooney could have played Uncle Tom. Minstrel shows started as a black man's entertainment for himself and the plantation owners. When they were filmed, though, they were done by a white cast. You figure that out. They were done as sort of a joke, and the black entertainer couldn't even get a job making fun of himself. The first really vicious anti-Negro film was called The Birth of a Nation, and it was a honey. And the second worst thing about it was that technically in 1918 it was the best movie that had ever been made. A cat named D.W. Griffith produced it, and he knew how. See? Birth of a Nation pretended to tell the story of the Civil War and what happened afterwards when the slaves were freed. White woman couldn't walk on her own sidewalk if you believed the picture. In the South, Negroes got the right to vote, and the movie showed black vote collectors refusing to accept white votes, and black people sneaking in extra votes. And if these black bad guys don't look very bad to you, it's probably because they were white actors wearing burnt cork. Negro legislators took over in the South, and in the film they were made to look like apes. And this was the movie version of how it looked in the Southern State Legislature. They drank whiskey, they ate chicken with their hands in the state house, and they put their feet up on the table with the shoes off. And of course, they passed all sorts of crazy laws according to the film, like anybody could marry anybody they wanted to. It was obvious to anyone who saw this picture that Negroes weren't fit to govern themselves or anyone else because they really weren't people. This film is 50 years old, and it may look silly and out of date now, but it didn't look silly when it was made and seen. Several million Americans who saw it were propagandized to believe that this is the way things would be if they weren't careful. So they've been pretty careful. Colonel Cameron, a former officer in the Confederate Army, is all upset over the way Northerners and the freed slaves are changing his South, taking the mint julep right out of his mouth. So he takes a walk one day while he's worrying about it, and he sees two white kids playing, and then four black kids come along. Being hardly human, and naturally afraid of ghosts, the black kids run. Colonel Cameron sees the whole scene, gets his great idea. And with this, that great white all-American organization, the KKK, was born. The cavalry and the bedsheet has come to the rescue. The South is saved. In this picture, the Ku Klux Klan was the good boy who saved the South. Most Hollywood films, though, even the early ones, weren't really nasty. Nobody was sitting around saying, hey, let's take care of the niggas. What producers were doing was making money. And to make money, they made pictures that white ticket buyers would enjoy. They showed Negroes the way most Americans like to think of them. To blame Hollywood is like throwing a rock at the mirror because you don't like what you see in it. Burt Williams was one of the great vaudeville performers. He couldn't get parts in white pictures, so he made a lot of short comedies. He played the part most Americans consider typical Negro. He wasn't bad, really, just lazy, stupid, and happy the way he was. And his feet hurt. He was afraid of most everything. And when he was scared, he shook and his teeth chattered. 
Unlike a scared white man, the black man's eyes could pop out of his head. When he was scared, he was so scared he couldn't talk. He was also so scared he couldn't run. Black women, on the other hand, were steady and imperturbable. They stood like a rock on the face of things that scared black men. Another strange physical characteristic was when they were really very scared. The guys turned white. When you look back on these old films, the patterns come jumping out at you. The most consistent thing about them was the attack on the black man. He was never even given the privilege of being a man. He was a boy. As in, you know, here boy. They had a lot of other great qualities besides being cowardly. For instance, they stole chickens. Who's in there? Who's in there? Ain't nobody in here but us chickens. They shot craps. That's your papa talking to you now, that's Come on. Just just hit them one more time. Ah. And lions weren't the only thing they were afraid of either. 